Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my epic rant on the 1989 sequel, The Karate Kid Part 3. Now, I'm not a fan of this film. I really do not care for this sequel. I think it's pretty shitty to uh, quote the character Mike Barnes. It's shit! It's nothing! Uh, that's honestly how I feel about The Karate Kid Part 3. Uh, it's one of the lamest sequels out there, in my opinion. It's right up there with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 and other lame sequels. Uh, it's so lame that I think The Next Karate Kid is a masterpiece in comparison. I know for some people that's blasphemy, but that's honestly how I feel about the, the, A Karate Kid Part 3. And the thing is, what, I didn't even like this when I was a kid. So it's not even one of those like nostalgia things. I, I, I thought it sucked when I was a kid. Uh, I remember going to a thrift store with my parents and my first exposure to the movie was finding it on VHS tape. And at that point, it was one of those things where I was honestly excited about the movie because I didn't even know it even existed in the first place. I didn't know there was a Karate Kid Part 3 until I saw it on VHS at the thrift store. And I, I got the film and I brought it home and I put it into my VCR and I watched it. And my enthusiasm slowly died and dissipated throughout the entire running time and then after it was over i ejected it from the vcr and i threw it out the window like like that's how much i hated this film even as a kid now i will say this i rewatched it uh recently and i do have a little more appreciation for certain things than i did when i was a kid but I still think this film sucks. Now, the film is uh, directed by John G. Alvidson. He came back. And honestly, I think someone else should have directed this movie. I think at this point in the franchise, the continuity wasn't really necessary and needed, especially five years. Not really five years. Well, five years after the first movie, but three years after the release of Karate Kid Part 2. And this was also around the time when John G. Avildsen's skill was starting to wane because directly after this, he did Rocky V, which I think is one of his weakest films when it comes to his directing. And it was just all downhill from there. So I think a, a different director could have injected some new life visually into this franchise that would have really helped this film i don't think that it would have saved the movie though because i think the film has so many other issues and uh moments where it's just a total kick in the nads that i don't think that better directing would really solve all of these uh problems with specifically the film script by robert mark Kamen. but the direction would still provide a nice boost, a nice little extra kick that it didn't have with John G. Alvidson's direction. Uh, even the fight scenes in this were very um, weak. They didn't really have the same intensity or power or strength that they had in the other two films or uh, Avildsen had shown in other movies in his uh, filmography. I will say I did have some nice looking shots of uh, Miyagi and Daniel training on a mountain in front of the sun or uh, a few other nice uh, sweeping uh, sequences that were showcasing the beauty of the landscape. But that might not even necessarily be something that John G. Avildsen was responsible for. That could have been really more of the cinematographer than anything else. Because a lot of the movie looks like a cheap TV karate kid pilot it really does like the first two films looked very theatrical like they actually did have a certain look to them that really did make it seem like 
they were worthy of a theatrical release. Karate Kid Part 3 visually looks very flat, looks really uh, quite lackluster. And I, I think a lot of that is due to just weak direction by John G. Avildsen. But at the same time, John, I don't think he was really that enthusiastic about doing this movie uh from what i've read and what i've seen from him like he's not a fan of this film either uh in fact he thought the script was so bad that it really affected his his uh direction yeah he, he called uh karate kid part three a horrible imitation of the original it was hastily written and sloppily rewritten uh, and then he said it will baffle those who haven't seen the first two movies and insult those who have. And I agree wholeheartedly with him. Like, if you if this is the first Karate Kid film you saw, you'd be confused and you'd be like, what? Why do people think these films are so great? This is this is really bad. This is cheesy and corny and lame. And why do people think this Karate Kid character of Daniel is so cool? Uh yeah, I agree with him wholeheartedly. And it is an insult to the first two films, especially when it comes to the character of Daniel LaRusso. But I'll get to that when I when I start uh, taking aim at, at the film's screenplay. But yeah, the direction, it's just nowhere near on par with the direction of the first two films. And I think in large part, it's due to the fact that John just didn't really have the same passion for this that he had for the first two Karate Kid films. Now, the script by Robert Mark Kamen, this script is stupendously shitty. Like, this is a really bad screenplay. First off, it does not understand the tone of the Karate Kid franchise, which is glaringly obvious early on. It has a very cartoonish, comic book-style tone, and that was proven to actually be something that can work in this franchise in Cobra Kai. But in Cobra Kai, that was established from the very beginning. And with Karate Kid Part 3, it's coming right after two films that in a lot of ways were very dramatic and had a lot of serious things in them. And then you've got Terry Silver who might as well be a villain in James Bond Jr. or uh, Captain Planet because he's uh, polluting the environment. <laughs> it's one of those things where you're like, where did this character come from? Where did this tone come from? This is so off that it's off-putting. And then if that isn't bad enough, it takes the character of Daniel LaRusso and completely erases all of the progress that his character made throughout the first two films. I heard that, yes, the initial plan for Karate Kid Part 2 was to focus on Kreese's revenge and to have this script or this storyline be in the second one, but they decided to expand upon Miyagi's uh, mythology and his story more and his character, which was the right call. But that doesn't excuse these decisions, because even if it was the second film, it still completely denigrates and seriously harms the character of Daniel LaRusso, because he's back to being scared and intimidated by bullies. It's like he already fought Cobra Kai and Johnny Lawrence in the first movie, and he held his own, and then he went to Okinawa in the second film, and he got into a fight to the death with Chosen, and won, and I'm supposed to buy that now he's quaking in his boots and pissing his pants over Mike Barnes, and, and Barnes's bullies, and Terry Silver... It's a bunch of fucking bullshit. It's insulting. John was right. It's insulting. It's a kick in the nads. And he also doesn't learn anything. He not only goes back to being a total wimp and not being able to really hold his own in a fight except for like one scene 
But then he's like scared and pissing his pants over Mike Barnes in the tur- in the final uh, fight in the tournament where he's trying to defend his title. And prior to that, you have the whole stuff with Terry Silver and Daniel is a dumbass now who doesn't understand that Terry Silver's just trying to hurt him. Like, I mean, just look at his training. He's asking him to punch heavy boards until his knuckles bleed. I guess one of those things is like, I think you should have realized at that point that this is not something that's going to benefit you in an actual tournament. This is just something to inflict pain upon you. And this guy is a nut job. But no. He doesn't think that at all and just keeps going back to Terry Silver and keeps getting hurt. And then eventually he gets a clue after he punches some guy in the face in a bar and feels regret and then thinks that he's just like Johnny Lawrence, which that whole thing where Daniel becomes Cobra Kai or he embraces those elements of, of, his dark side that was something that definitely had potential but it was just so poorly executed in this script that it didn't really resonate as strongly as it initially should have and speaking of not resonating the love story between daniel and uh jessica that didn't resonate at all because they didn't even try. It was actually rewritten last minute because Ralph Macchio had aged so much that, that he was no longer young enough to be able to really be in a relationship with an underage actress, at least on screen. So they they had to rewrite things and made it so they were just fast friends for a little bit. They went on a a little date, but they never really became a couple, which has made that whole thing completely pointless. And what makes it even more insulting is that you had the relationship with Daniel and Kumiko that was so strong and so great from Karate Kid Part 2, and then you completely just destroy that by having Kumiko break up with Daniel and go join some dance uh, school in Japan or whatever. And I honestly don't buy that. They could not have brought back Tamil and Tamita because Tamil and Tamita was not like a household name after karate kid part two, even though that film was successful. It's not like she had tons and tons of jobs that she was doing in 1989. So I think they easily could have brought that character back. And if they, couldn't bring her back, then don't have a pointless love story in the first place. It's just useless filler that adds nothing to the story and nothing to the film except padding to the runtime. And that's another disturbing trend when it comes to this script. Just so much useless garbage when it comes to these plot points. The trash love story, which was an afterthought and should have been put in the shredder and just forgotten about the whole thing with uh, Miyagi and his bonsai tree business. It never gets off the ground. You never see it be successful because Mike Barnes and his goons tear up the shop and it's not like Miyagi goes back to doing the business. Well, he, he, keeps on working on it and helps out with uh, the other bonsai trees and whatever, but we never see it be that successful throughout the entire movie. So it just makes the whole bonsai tree business thing feel completely, utterly worthless and useless because there's nothing that really happens from it other than it's something for Miyagi and Daniel to do. And that's about it. And then you have the whole stuff where, Oh, Miyagi doesn't want Daniel to fight to uh, defend his title. And the only reason why that's going on is so you have a reason for Daniel to turn to Terry Silver. But even that's clunky. 
And speaking of Terry Silver, the way that he's written is an absolute joke as well. I mean, what is this shit? He's acting like he's a James Bond Jr. villain. He's a total cartoon. I understand he has his fans. I'm not one of them when it comes to his performance in this movie. When it comes to his performance in Cobra Kai, I, I'm a big fan of that. Because in Cobra Kai, it works. The tone is better. Here, it's, it's, it's very jarring. And Kreese is jarring, too. Because, like, the opening scene, he's, like, drunk and stumbling through the streets. And you're supposed to sympathize with him. Which is a bad idea to begin with. And then he shows up, gets help from Terry Silver. And then there's one scene later where he shows up to intimidate Daniel. And it's, it's something that is just incredibly ridiculous. He shows up like a demented jack-in-the-box with a stupid grin on his face. And he goes, boo, you know, ah, <laughs> it's like, what? What is this shit? Even Kreese comes across even more over the top and ridiculous than he did in the first movie. Then you have Mike Barnes, who is turning everything up to 11 and just yelling and screaming and furring his brows and just tr making mean faces and trying way too damn hard to be karate's bad boy and failing miserably if you ask me you have the whole bit at the end where he's kicking daniel's ass in the tournament and he's just insulting miyagi and being a racist and telling uh, daniel that his his karate is shit and he's worthless and I, and that's how i feel about this movie it's worthless it's shit it's nothing they didn't even need to make this movie, especially if it's going to be as bad as this. The love story is useless. The whole stuff with Daniel is insulting because he's learned nothing from the first two films. He's now reverted back to where he was at the start of the first film. The tournament is lame because for some dumb reason, he's advanced all the way to the finals without even having to lift a finger. And then the whole fight between him and Mike Barnes is this whole lame bullshit where, oh, Terry Silver's plan is to have Mike Barnes just keep kicking Daniel and keep hitting him uh, and lose a point so we can keep punishing him and then lead to sudden death where then he will humiliate him and win the title and Cobra Kai will be reborn. And I'm like, why the hell... Didn't the ref just disqualify Mark Mike Barnes' ass after he did it, like, the second time? I mean, because the script says so. It's how bad this script is by Robert Mark Kamen. It's hard to believe that he wrote the first two. Like, what happened here? Did his brain get s stolen by aliens or some shit? Uh, w was this written by the Invasion of the Body Snatchers? version of robert mike mark came in because this is one of those things it's just baffling to me that this script is this bad and this tone deaf and this unable to connect the varying threads from the previous two films in the series so yeah the tournament sucks even the way that daniel defeats mike barnes is cringe doing these stupid Tai Chi moves and then beats Mike Barnes with one punch. So even that's not satisfying. The only things that I will give this script credit for is some of the concepts and ideas. Turning Daniel to the dark side is a good idea. Too bad that this script dropped the fucking ball. But yeah, still a good idea. There are some lines from Mr. Miyagi that I thought were really good uh, when he's talking about the roots of a tree and how that relates to Daniel and his life. Uh, also, the scene where Daniel is afraid and he's scared and he doesn't want to fight Mike Barnes anymore. He wants to quit. And Miyagi uh, gives him some inspiration by telling him that it's okay to lose to opponents, but must not lose to fear. Like, I think that's a great quote. 
I really think that works. But th that's really about it. Because none of the other like fight scenes at any point are really that satisfying. Even the bit where Miyagi fights uh, Terry Silver and Kreese, like even that has just the tone is just wildly uneven with Mr. Miyagi going wah and just poking fun at Terry Silver and Terry Silver getting paint knocked all over him. And also that's the other thing too. Miyagi makes such quick work of Terry Silver and, and Crease in that scene that now they're not intimidating at all for the rest of the movie. And speaking of not intimidating, Mike Barnes didn't do it for me and neither did his bullies. And like, what was Mike Barnes doing anyway? Why did he was such a badass, but he had to have this crew of cronies that would follow him around everywhere and like do a lot of the dirty work. Like why didn't he just do most of the shit himself? If he's such a badass. So yeah, this script sucks. And the thing is, it also could have been fixed rather easily. If you're not going to have Kumiko, then don't have a love story to begin with. Just focus the film solely on the next step in Daniel and Miyagi's connection with one another. And I would still keep the whole Daniel going to the dark side thing with Terry Silver, but I would tone down the over the top cartoonish villain stuff because it doesn't really work here in this franchise when it comes to this tone that the film series is trying to go with see that's the thing about terry silver like there are some moments where he's not being over the top where he's actually pretty sinister and the moments where he's tricking daniel and he's trying to act like a good guy those are effective that's why i would just have him play it straight for the most part just be manipulative without the maniacal laughing and the ah, ha, 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 ha. Ah, that's a great idea. I like it. So like without any of that shit. Just 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 have it be more straightforward and just sinister and manipulative. And make it so Crease doesn't jump out like a jack in the box later on in the movie as well. You can have Crease, that's fine. And that's the whole reason why Silver's brought in, because Silver was friends with Crease and and he's doing a favor for Crease. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But yeah, you focus the film on the next step with Miyagi and Daniel. And I would have it really lead up to a point where Miyagi is the one that gets humbled. Miyagi is the one that gets defeated. I would have a, a, a confrontation between uh, Miyagi and Silver, or maybe Miyagi and uh, 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 Mike Barnes, and Miyagi gets hurt. Miyagi is the one that gets hurt, and Miyagi gets hurt because he picks a fight, which is something that goes against his teachings, because he says, he, he said many times in, before, you know, must not choose to fight. You know, it's one of those things like there must be a reason behind fighting other than pride. And, and he fights because Mike Barnes is, is just terrorizing Daniel and he fights Barnes and Barnes hurts him. So then that causes Miyagi to actually go into a shell and he starts drinking sake again. And it's Miyagi who is the one that is mean towards Daniel. Miyagi is the one that forces Daniel away from him. And that's why Daniel goes to Terry Silver. And then you can have some of Silver's more extreme techniques. And it would fit better. Because... Daniel is, is upset at Miyagi because Miyagi has basically told him that you know, he, he should have never fought for Daniel and that really hurts Daniel and Daniel 
at this point, he doesn't really want to have much to do with Miyagi and Miyagi-Do and all the teachings. And that leads him to go to the dark side. And it's through this training with Silver and the resurgence of Kreese and a moment where Daniel gets really hurt and becomes something that he hates that he goes back to Miyagi and he picks Miyagi up and builds him back up and shows Miyagi a different perspective, uh, provides some of his own wisdom to Miyagi based upon the lessons that Miyagi taught him. And then Miyagi trains Daniel again and agrees to let him fight. You don't need the bonsai tree business stuff. Like if you wanted to have that in there, that's okay. But actually show it be successful initially so that when Mike Barnes and his goons come in and tear up the place and destroy his business, it's all the more tragic because it actually did get off the ground and it was successful. And then, yeah, you actually have Miyagi train Daniel because there's another thing that this, this script was lacking. Training scenes. Like, oh, we just trained him kata. Okay, all right, that's cool, that's fine. But what about any new skills to use in a fight? Nothing. I, I think they were trying to make the kata something that he used to defeat Mike Barnes, but it just came across as incredibly weak. So have him train Daniel kata, but also train him some other things, maybe some other move. And then with the tournament, actually have Daniel fight in the tournament from the very beginning and not have this whole stuff where he's pushed forward to the end. And then in the fight with Mike Barnes, have Daniel actually get the upper hand. And actually prior to that, have Daniel kick some ass. Like have Daniel be a very accomplished fighter. He's got a new focus some new skills that Miyagi has taught him. And he's so good at fighting in these early rounds that he's causing silver and crease to start sweating. And then you lead to the final, uh, the finale, the fight with uh, Mike Barnes and Daniel, he's the one that gets up early on Barnes, but then Barnes the one, is the one that has to keep fighting back. And then it leads to sudden death. And then Daniel wins handily. And then that leads to Barnes shaking his hands, uh, them having some mutual respect. Cobra Kai is dead. Um, Miyagi, you know, looks back at Daniel and winks at him again or puts his arms around him as they walk out of the tunnel with the crowd cheering. That, to me, is a much better version of this movie. It's a more fitting conclusion to the trilogy. It expands upon uh, Daniel and Miyagi's characters. You get to see a different perspective of Miyagi that you didn't see in any, any of the other films. Like you had that one scene of vulnerability with Daniel and Miyagi where Miyagi is sharing his story, the tragedy of what happened to his, his wife and his kid. And... I think that you could have a similar sort of dynamic, but this time around it's Miyagi being upset and, and distraught and torn because he went against his teachings and he lost his honor in the process and he just goes back to the bottle and lashes out at Daniel. Instead of Daniel being the one that's predictably lashing out at Miyagi, it's Miyagi who's the one that's lashing out at Daniel. And I think that would be a, a, a nice switch on things. And, and, and seeing Miyagi in a vulnerable state, actually seeing Miyagi get hurt in a fight, that would also add some extra stakes to this story. Instead, he just wipes the floor with uh, Kreese and, and, and um, Silver as if he's a superhero. So, yeah, there's just a lot of things that this script just completely whiffed on, if you ask me. And even the performances weren't really that solid either. I mean, Ralph Macchio, I actually think this is one of his weakest performances. And 
Ralph has actually said in a lot of interviews that he's not a fan of this film and his heart wasn't in it. And you could definitely tell uh, he didn't really have the same charisma, the same energy. It didn't help either that he had aged. He no longer really looked like a, a teenager. He looked like a, a young man. And it was rather laughable to have him try to portray uh, Daniel one year after the events of the first movie. Uh, I think that's another mistake. Maybe they should have switched things around and maybe had it be a little bit later in Daniel's life or something. Because it was rather laughable to try to to pull that off. Uh, and I don't think uh, Dan, uh, uh, Ralph Macchio's costume designer did him any favors either. Uh, neither did his hairdresser. Like that haircut was terrible and it did not look good on him. And neither did any of these clothes. It made him look like a like a like a wimp, and and that's not really what you want from the third film in the series, especially after he fought to the death with Chosen in the last movie. But yeah, Ralph Macchio, not anywhere near as solid or charismatic or good here. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not going to 100% blame him for uh, his weak performance because the script was really bad. It didn't give him a lot to work with. And then Pat Morita, he's trying. He's trying hard. He really is. There are some moments where he's able to salvage some moments of uh, excellence from this film just because of how good he is at playing this role but they're few and far between as well Thomas Ian Griffith in his first acting role is all over the place you can tell that this is a very early role for him he doesn't really have the balance yet when it comes to uh, his his acting and I just felt that the performance was just laughable and not in a good way for me personally. Um, Robin Lively, she's just there. She has no chemistry with Ralph Macchio and the script doesn't do her any favors because it makes her a character that's completely useless. Uh, Sean Kanan, uh, I know he like tore his abdominal wall doing stunts for this film and that's a crazy amount of dedication and he and he just took some painkillers and toughed it out and finished the sh finished the shoot and then went to the hospital. But I didn't think he was that great in this film. I, I don't I don't understand the amount of praise for uh, Mike Barnes. Uh, I didn't find this performance to be memorable, let alone that intimidating. He's got this stupid looking haircut. And he's always screaming and yelling and just over emoting and trying way too hard to be a badass to the point where it just wasn't believable. I never bought it. Sean Kanan just tried too hard it, and, and it was just so obvious on screen that I never bought him as a badass, let alone a bad boy of karate. Uh, and the rest of the cast of I mean, Martin Cove <laughs> with, with his hair that looks like he stuck his finger in a light socket and just he's barely even in the movie too. like crease is back, but it's not like he's in the film that much. And what you get of crease is pretty atrocious. It's embarrassing. That whole scene where he pops up like a Jack in the box and, and tries to scare Daniel. It was embarrassing. Daniel's like a teenager. This is a grown ass man popping up like a jack in the box, trying to intimidate and scare a, a, a teenager. <laughs> and that's honestly the rest of the cast I think is worth mentioning. I mean, I know you have Jonathan Avildsen who plays Snake, uh, John's son, William Christopher Ford who plays Dennis, but. Um, and you also have Randy Heller, who uh, plays um, Lucille, uh, Daniel's mom. And you also have the actress Frances Bay, who plays Mrs. Milo. And she's been in like a ton of different things. Um, but yeah, I just... Even the cast wasn't really that impressive. The performances weren't really that... Uh, 
uh, great across the board either. The cinematography by Steve Iaconelli, there are some moments where it is honestly as nice to look at as the first two films. Uh, the shot that's that's on the poster of Daniel and, and uh, Miyagi on the mountain with the sun in the background. Uh, some of the other sequences involving uh, Daniel and Jessica trying to get Miyagi's bonsai tree. And a few other moments here and there. Uh, so it, it's a film that has some shots that are really impressive visually. But a lot of it's just scenery stuff. And then there's a lot of other shots that are less than impressive. So it's very inconsistent when it comes to its visual splendor. And the editing by John G. Avidson and John Carter is also just kind of there. The score by Bill Conti is very forgettable and just feels like it's just recycling notes from the first movie. Um, and I don't really remember that much when it comes to the score for Karate Kid Part 3. And I definitely don't remember much when it comes to the songs on the soundtrack. It was this lame ballad at the end credits that is nowhere near as good as, as the glory of love. And other than that, like what other songs did they even have in this film? Like that's another thing that was disappointing about this movie, the soundtrack, like the first two films had at least one really good song, if not two. And this has nothing. And it was, it wasn't two hours, but it still felt long because it just felt like it was just a series of loosely connected stories and plots that were just thrown in there because this film dealt with a lot of rewrites and, and it's very evident. Just a very lazy script. I mean, Ralph Macchio said it the best. He said, it's the first movie without all the good parts. Yeah, <laughs> that is a great way to sum up the Karate Kid Part 3. And here's, an, here's some more uh, uh, statements from uh, Ralph Macchio. He uh, said that he was disappointed with the film, stating that he just felt for the LaRusso character, and he was upset that he never went forward. And then when doing the Karate Kid Part 3, it felt like we were redoing the first movie in a cartoon kind of sense without the heart and soul. Am. Nailed it. Preach. Machio. Preach. And we already had a Karate Kid Part... Uh, see, I can't even... I can't even speak clearly because I'm so heated about this movie, apparently. We already had a Karate Kid cartoon series. Around this time in the 80s. We already had that. That already existed. And Terry Silver felt like somebody that you would see in that cartoon. It's just the wrong tone for this franchise. It works in a cartoon, but it doesn't necessarily work in the same fashion in live action. Unless you have a consistent tone that you have from the very beginning. Which is not the case with this franchise. If this was a campy, over-the-top series of films then this whole approach would work better but it's not so it's just a kick in the nads it's kicking the nards kicking the taint kicking the face so yeah uh it's one of those films that just does not really provide a lot of solid entertainment or character depth or interest it's just a really lame sequel but anyway thanks for watching uh my rant on the karate kid part three and as always i'll see you later see ya